He drinks a whiskey drink. He drinks a vodka drink. He drinks a vodka drink. He drinks a cider drink. He sings the songs that remind him of the good times. He sings the songs that remind him of the best times. Hello, everybody. My name is Connor Nielsen, and welcome to a special spoiler discussion of the newest and, I, I guess, final installment in Fox's X-Men franchise, simply titled Dark Phoenix. Uh, it asks the daring what-if question of what would happen if you gave the same property or same storyline to the same creator who in a lot of people's eyes botched it the first time. <laughs> uh, but my name is Connor Nielsen. I'm not the only one here. I am here with the person who's, who runs this channel, the comics kid 2099. How are you doing comics kid? I'm doing very well. Uh, I just saw the movie earlier today and, uh, I, I don't really, I don't know. Um, this movie is, uh, I'm going to feel very, I, not in a daze, but just like not really sure where to take the conversation, but we'll, we'll take it somewhere. Um, so like you said, this movie uh, follows the Dark Phoenix story once again. Um, if you saw X-Men The Last Stand, it's kind of sort of that, uh, except there's aliens. And uh, it involves uh, the class of characters that we've been seeing for the last several movies. Uh, James McAvoy, Michael Fassbender, Jennifer Lawrence, Nicholas Holt. You know, those guys from the last few X-Men movies are in it here, and uh, it's it's a movie. Uh, Connor, what did you think of this? <laughs> um, well, it was terrible, but it, it, it's not one of those things where... So going into this was almost like going into some kind of, like, autopsy, mm -hmm. and... And, and like, I don't, I don't say that in saying, like, this movie was dead on arrival, but it kind of was where this movie was not conceived as the final Fox X-Men film. No. Uh, but it was sort of turned into that along the way. And especially with, I mean, the, the final nail in the coffin for this franchise was Disney purchasing Fox. And then once Disney got their hands on marketing this movie, boy, did they let you know this was the last one. Yeah. Uh, um, so much so that I wonder if New Mutants is even coming out. Uh, but they did they did put out like a big document that just had all their movies that they do have releases for, and uh, movies like Avatar two through five got new releases, so they don't bump into uh, Star Wars releases. And then New Mutants is like coming out in March of next year, which would make it two years after it was originally supposed to come out. Mm -hmm. I, I, I um anyways, but. So so going into this, it, it was it was just sort of like, just thanks for the memories. I'll watch this out of respect, and then I watched it, and it wasn't really good at all. But I'm not angry about it because it it was bad, but it wasn't bad in like this bizarre, captivating way. It was just sort of bad in very familiar, very boring ways. Mm -hmm. So. But there's a lot of ways, so we might be here a while. <laughs> and uh, I'll, I'll try to make it entertaining. I know you always try to make things entertaining. So that's sort of what it was like on my end, having this experience. You sound flabbergasted. And when we were texting earlier today, you had said that you would be okay with doing this discussion tomorrow. And I assume that probably is because you wanted to wrap your head around it? Partly, yeah. Um, this movie, it's not even... It's not the worst X-Men movie, okay? Like, um, I, it came out last weekend. We're recording this, you know, the following week after it came out. And I saw multiple people saying this is the second worst X-Men movie of all time. And, like, Rotten Tomatoes, I don't remember the exact numbers, but this is, like, 30 points lower than X-Men The Last Stand. And so I was, at the time, like, really excited. Like, oh, boy, everyone hates this. This is going to be a train wreck. I can't wait to see what it gets wrong. And it's not... I think you and I are kind of coming at it the same way. It's not an enjoyable bad movie. Like, it's not a fun train wreck. It's just a very dull train wreck. And it's not even like, oh, this is a, you know, a negative 50 million out of 10. This is like the definition of mid. This is like, you know, I would give this a 5 out of 10. Like, there have been worse X-Men movies, but, like, this is not... It's not, like, horrible, but it's not great either, you know? It's just kind of middle of the road for me. See, it's fascinating that you say that because I guess our two opinions are kind of what I'm noticing as the general range of opinions where I am noticing a lot of people like like Chris Stuckman 
uh, on YouTube, but then a lot of other like publisher, like published, uh, like in, in uh, newspapers and magazine uh, critics giving it like two out of four, two and a half out of five. Like, you know what I mean? Just mm-hmm. very middle of the road of, eh, it's kind of a wet blanket. And then I, if I had to give this like a score, I'd give it like a two. Mm-hmm. But the reason I'd give it a two is because it was a January movie. <laughs> like it was, uh, it was just one of those things where I was just kind of bewildered that a big Fox tentpole action movie, which this was originally conceived of, this wasn't originally conceived as the final installment of this, just a general like action movie that I would expect. Like, like I, I was shocked at how cheap it was. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's, the thing that just kept sticking in my head it's a january movie look how cheap it is like only a january movie will have x-men costumes that bad like only a january movie would have a musical score this bad only a january movie would have like wigs this bad like it was it was just like something that it was the thought that i couldn't shake no matter how hard i tried yeah and uh you know you mentioned new mutants getting pushed back this one did too. This one, I think, changed its release date twice. And I had heard rumors, and I had completely forgotten this until I went home after watching the movie. I read the trivia on it, and I remember this now. Originally, the climax of this movie was supposed to be shot, or was supposed to be set in outer space. And the climax is a fine climax. If, if I didn't know that, I would be like, you know, that was an okay little action scene. But when you hear that it's supposed to have been set in outer space, and then it's like, nah, we decided to go for a train. Like... That's just so, like, so much lower. Like, you know, you know, we, you can do something exciting on a train, but when you hear that originally it was going to be set in outer space, that seems so much more grand than what they went with. And I think that's kind of going along with what you were saying. Like, there are things about this movie where I'm just like, wow, that seems so much less than what I would expect. Um, like, the island of Genosha shows up in this movie. It's never called that. You wouldn't know what it is if you don't know anything about X-Men comics, but it looks like the island is about one mile long, <laughs> and Genosha is supposed to be this gigantic, huge, thriving mutant nation. And it's like they're living in outhouses in a small, tiny little island somewhere. And yeah, <laughs> I, maybe that was intentional. I don't know. But it, there's so much about this, like, where I'm just like, I, I don't I don't know, guys. Like, and you, I think what you and I are both coming out as saying is that if this had a sequel, if we knew we were going to get, like, you know, X-Men Onslaught in two years... If we were going to get something like that, this might be a little bit more exciting to us, at least for me, because there are definitely points, especially in the last, like, 15 minutes of the movie, where I was thinking, wow, if we were getting a sequel, I'd be interested to see what they're doing with what they've got here, where all the pieces are set at the end, but we're not. We're getting a movie that is the finale, and it was never intended to be, like you said. Um, Like, I saw a, a teaser on Twitter... And this was back when Endgame was fresh on everyone's minds, and the, this thing was, like, showing clips from all the X-Men movies, and it said, everything's been leading to this. And I, I said, really? It hasn't, though. Like, nothing has been <laughs> building to Dark Phoenix. It's been, and, and for ever since, really, I would say ever since uh, X-Men Origins Wolverine, but it's been apparent since Days of Future Past to me, they haven't had a plan. They've just been planning one movie at a time, and... Now it's just like, well, you know, this is it. It kind of just ends in a fizzle. It doesn't really leave me feeling anything. I'm just feeling numb. Yeah. Um, so you said a couple things there and uh, <laughs> that I want to respond to. Um, so I remember when X-Men Apocalypse came out, me and you in our podcast were very uh, vocally supportive of that movie, it seems like. Mm-hmm. I don't know. It's weird. That's a movie where if I'm in the company of people who don't like it, I can bash on it pretty hard. But if I'm in the company of people who do like it, I can talk very nicely about it for a while as well. Uh, I think it's a very mediocre movie, uh, like a six or a five out of ten. Um, I'll give it a six. Like it, 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 it's not particularly good, is what I'm trying to say. I don't think so, anyways. But and I, I, and I, and I remember when me and my brother walked out of it. My brother said uh, that he he did not care about what happened next, and he was kind of hoping they would reboot. Like, that's what his feelings were, leaving Apocalypse. And I can understand that, but after watching this, like, if there was another movie, I don't, I would have, like, no interest in it. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and 
some of that, like, and, and some people do enjoy, like, the, the train scene at the end and how they do think it gets sort of better. Um, I guess so. Uh, it didn't really get better for me. Uh, I think there were some more interesting, like, action choices, but the general story I just didn't really get much more enjoyable to me. Um, but I, I don't know. Like, I, I just thought this was such a, like, a blank fart and, like, such a... Like, you know, the way Jacques Renault describes himself in Fire Walk With Me is he's as blank as a fart. And that's a great way of describing this movie. I, I just... Eh. <laughs> um, yeah. So I guess that's where our opening stance is. Um, and, and I did see that same clip as you did, by the way. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and uh, it's all been leading to this. And I kind of knew that. And, I mean, I, I knew that it had a troubled production. And, and also, good movies don't get their release dates pushed back constantly like this. Unless you're Titanic, in which case you're an exception. So, yeah. And I, I should say, when I said I was interested in, I would have been interested in what's to come based on the last, I, I'm, you know, there's some stuff, I, we'll get to it later, but like, there's a few different characters who kind of go off in unexpected directions at the end. Uh, the status quo is mm. left a little bit more slightly turned than it usually is, but based on the pattern of the, of these X-Men movies, honestly, I'm surprised this one didn't start with the X-Men having to come together. You know, yeah, first class is <laughs> yeah. the X-Men coming together, and then at the end, it's like, yeah, we're the X-Men now. And then Days of Future Past, it's like, oh, the X-Men disbanded. We're going to have to come together. And yeah, we're the X-Men now. And then X-Men Apocalypse, it's like, well, we have a school, but we don't have the X-Men, so we're going to have to come together, and we're the X-Men now. And I, I was pretty surprised we didn't get that in this movie. Like, if this was a Brian Singer movie, I'm 1,000% sure he would have found a way to make that happen again. Um, but if we were if we were to get a sequel to this, like, I'm sure they would find some way to undo all of the stuff I was somewhat interested in. Um, the, I'm just saying, like, just as a movie, looking at this, like, oh, you know, if this was a franchise that I had cared about, you know, since, uh, like, the last time I really cared about the X-Men was probably First Class, uh, if this is a franchise I cared about since before then, then, you know, I would be interested in seeing where they're going to go with, like, a new school and a new headmaster and stuff like that. But now, knowing the people behind these movies, if they were to magically say right now, hey, we're not integrating with the MCU, we're going to do another X-Men movie set in this world, I would not be interested in what they're doing. Yeah. Um, so uh, let, me, let me talk about positives. Okay, yeah. Sadly, I don't have a whole lot of them. <laughs> um, and... You actually mentioned one of them, which was the structure is different than the last three. Um, lately, I've noticed uh, the the last release I noticed of like a collected edition at, uh, at like Best Buy of one of the X Men movies was it was First Class, Days of Future Past, and Apocalypse, and it was called the Beginnings Trilogy. And I and I've always thought why why is it called that? And then you just brought up the exact reason why it was like in all three of them they're beginning the X Men. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So uh, this this isn't a beginnings quadrilogy. Uh, the X Men is an existed. I like the status quo we're in at the beginning. Uh, the the very opening scene, you know, I, I think James McAvoy is Professor Xavier because what does Professor Xavier do? He gives hope to naive people, and I was naive at the beginning of this movie. <laughs> would be good, and he gave me hope because uh, he, James McAvoy is so good at this. Um, just like the beginning where he's talking about we all have our gifts and we can do whatever we want with the gifts. And he's, and I thought the little, little Jean Grey was very movie kid where she can talk like an adult and she knows what's really going on, man. Don't talk to me like I'm a kid. But, you know, I, I thought, I thought uh, James McAvoy was just so good. And it's like just fresh off the, it, his character is right like just two or three years after uh, Days of Future Past. And that's still my favorite X-Men movie. So... Um, yeah, I, uh, I I love the beginning. I like the status quo. Um, I like how in the action scenes they're incorporating like power teamwork more often. Mm-hmm. Like, there's a really fun bit where uh, Professor X is like mind controlling a person to not be moving, and then he's like, "Hey, Cyclops, give me a hand here," and then Cyclops uses his beam and reflects it off of a car mirror to knock the person out. Mm -hmm. And, like, you're seeing people, like, help each other out, and it's a lot of fun, and I don't feel like we got to see a whole... We didn't see a whole lot of that in previous movies. Um, So, or if we did, it was a little... It it wasn't as well-oiled as that was. Uh, 
So I like that stuff. Um, I have no idea why Magneto's in this movie, but you know, yeah. Michael Fassbender's good at being Magneto. Um, it's almost an hour into the movie because I had my I looked at my clock when we finally arrive at like I saw the island. I was like, oh, this is Genosha. This is their attempt at Genosha. And I looked at my clock. It's like it's been almost an hour. Like, and you know, that's part of like the the beginnings trilogy framework is you know Magneto starts off like you know in the first one it's like hey he's a he's kind of a good guy and then he becomes a bad guy and then in days of future past it's like hey he's on their side and then he's against them again and in apocalypse it's the opposite of that it's he's against them and then he's on their side again at least this one it, it's going to sound weird but at least he doesn't have a character arc because if he did <laughs> it would just be the same thing we've seen but it's also this is a really disappointing note for him to go out on um and i'll say it's that's probably true for most of them like when you think about it like I didn't mean to interrupt you. You go ahead with what you were saying. Oh, I no, that's perfectly um, fine. Uh, most of the characters in this movie just don't get anything to do, um, and that's so like this is a short movie. First yes, of all. like yes, um, it's very short. I because I noticed it, it for me it was like about two o'clock when it started. It wasn't even four o'clock when I was heading home. Like it it's uh doesn't even clock in at two hours, which is probably okay because I, I don't know what else this movie would have done to have you know made me miserable, but. Like, it's none of the characters, you know, like, Quicksilver is in it for, like, three minutes, and then he gets thrown into a building, and then he's out the rest of the movie. Like, it was a good halfway into the movie before I was realizing, wait a minute, we're not going to get a Quicksilver scene in this one. And, you know, that's okay. We've already had two funny Quicksilver scenes in two movies, so I didn't need, you know, the offspring playing while he rescues people from an explosion or something. But also, like he could be doing something. It doesn't have to be a repeat of Days of Future Past and Apocalypse, but he could be doing something, right? Yeah. You know, I was scrolling through reviews on Letterboxd, and I saw a a, uh, a review that said uh, Quicksilver running to Chowamba Wumba <laughs> was, was uh, felt out of place. And I was like, oh, bummer, dude, you spoiled, like, the Quicksilver scene, like, what the song is. I'm like, oh, well. And then I watched the movie, I'm like, oh, my God, I got trolled. I got trolled hard. <laughs> because, like, I thought that, like, when he does have his moment where he, like, uh, starts doing his powers, but then, like, Phoenix is able to trick him out, you know? Just like the scene from Apocalypse, but yeah. whatever. Um I thought, he, I'm like, oh my god, please don't put in your headphones and listen to Tub Thumping by Chowamba Wumba. <laughs> and then it didn't happen, and I'm like, okay, <laughs> good, but at the same time, like... But, you know, like, you know, that, though, we, we've, I've been writing the, the Brian Singer prequel X-Men movies a little bit, and the math, you know, well, let's, yeah, I mean, it's hard to lump in Matthew Vaughn in first class, because he was kind of setting up a formula, and then Brian Singer was just following it, so that's not necessarily yeah. Matthew Vaughn's fault, but... Like, I've been kind of, like, you know, slapping those movies in the face a little bit here, but at least those movies have moments of levity, right? This movie yeah. doesn't. It's so dour. And, like, I, I was trying to think. I was like, there is not a single moment in this movie that makes you smile or anything. Like, the, there's, I think the closest we get is when Jean Grey starts downing shots and sending Scott to go get more drinks. Like, that's the closest we get to, like, a joke in this movie, and it's not funny. Like, it, it's I, I haven't seen a movie so joyless since Batman vs. Superman. Wow. Yeah, no, like, you're right. I, it's, that is one of the things that kind of was, was hitting on me while I was watching it. Cause I, I like movies that are dour. Like I, I can't, I should, I should say I can like movies that are dour. Mm -hmm. Right. Like I like, I, I try, I think I can like anything, but at the same time, if I don't like something, I don't like something. And if it's down and it's not working, then I'm going to say it's not working. And this kind of fell into that category where it felt dour. And maybe that just sort of added to what I felt was cheap because a lot of bad January movies are very serious and they don't, they don't partake in the joy, you know? And, and this was full of that. I, I think that like, there's a potentially funny scene where, where Jean is like making everyone in a bar think she's an old man. Mm-hmm. But then it's like that could have been kind of funny, but it wasn't. It was not even played as a joke, um, or even slightly humorous. Um, it was just oh, this this old man with a hat. Well, that's Jean Grey. Yeah. And then the scene continues, and and it was like it was like a scene like that. Um, 
I no, I'm trying to. Th- I'll, I'll try to think of jokes as I go along, uh, but I right off the top of my head, I can't. I can't think of any. Um, I, I did think of a joke while I was watching the movie, though. Oh, let's hear it. Um, and then the movie fulfilled it, so I did laugh. So the movie was kind of funny to me, but not in the way that I think it wanted to be. Where uh, it was the scene from the trailer where Eric says, "There's always a speech, Charles, <laughs> and nobody cares." And then, like, but before he said that, I thought, "Oh, he's going to say, and nobody effing cares," because this is this is the superhero franchise where we get to drop <laughs> f bombs. And then I thought. And then he doesn't say that. I'm like, yeah, I guess they wouldn't say that in this scene. And then right as I thought that, yep. Cyclops. Cyclops comes on in and says, if you touch her, I'll effing kill you. <laughs> um, when, he said, was when he said that, I was looking at his, I don't know why, but I kind of, it looked like his mouth, it looked like they redubbed him. Like, it looked like he said it, and then it was like, later they said, oh, we have to fix it. And so it didn't look like that quite lined up with his mouth, but... Maybe I was just imagining that because I wasn't just wasn't just staring at Ty Sheridan's face, but I was just watching the screen and out of the corner of my eye. I was like, "Did they did they like reshoot him saying that or something?" Um, <laughs> if, know. It, you know, maybe maybe this is me just uh, 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 misremembering. But doesn't he begin that line? Uh, but it, you don't see his face saying it. Maybe because he he like, walks know. forward when he said, "I don't know." Um, I don't know, uh, but. Either way, uh, that that was a thing that was funny, and I remember at one point, oh, the funniest part of this movie is when Nightcrawler just goes berserk and kills everybody out of nowhere. Uh, yeah. Um, that was hilarious, because he's like, it reminded me of, like, I don't know why it reminded me of this, but there's a movie called The Miami Connection, where it ends with everybody, like, killing each other in, like, a big bloodbath, and then the ending text says, only through the power of peace and love can we achieve a world without violence. <laughs> <laughs> After just in indulging in violence for so long um yeah and and this movie it like it was weird because nightcrawler and, and nightcrawler like storm and like a few and like like really quick over um they kind of bring him up like you know nightcrawler and i'm like no i don't i didn't really get to know him all that well last movie mm-hmm. and i don't really know storm i didn't really get to know her all that well last movie uh you know quicksilver's barely in this i don't really know what he's been up to I don't know why this 45-year-old man looks like he's 28. <laughs> and and so, like, it, it was things like that, you know. And and so then the biggest, like, hindrance of this is where where Nightcrawler has a scene where he looks over and sees, like, a soldier kind of getting attacked by some aliens. And he's like, no, no. And then he, like, zaps to try to rescue him. And once he zaps him away, you don't really see what happened to the soldier, but he didn't make it. And he's like, and the Nightcrawler's like, I didn't make it! And he Mm -hmm. flips out and just starts killing everybody. And I'm like, what? Nightcrawler, of all people. Guys, if you're you're curious why we're so bum-fuzzled by this, he's he's supposed to be, like, the conscience of the team. Like, he is notably a Catholic. And I guess I'm not saying that if you're Catholic, you can't go on a killing spree. You know what? Do you do you? If you want, if you are a Catholic and you want to go kill a bunch of people, go go right ahead. But that's not who Nightcrawler is. That's like he would be the one stopping Wolverine and saying, "No, my friend, don't do that. No." And that just kind of became Christopher Walken for a second. But, um, you know no, what? That... On a completely unrelated note, I did watch the first twenty minutes of Batman Returns yesterday. <laughs> Christopher Walken is a joy to the human race. He is. Um, wouldn't it have been great if I don't know who they would have cast him as, but wouldn't it have been great if he was Quicksilver? Just like no explanation, just like <laughs> he's here and he's just like, yeah, it was mostly me. Uh, I mean, Gene did a few things, but it was mostly. I guess that was kind of a joke, sort of. Um, yeah, I, I guess it was. Yeah, yeah. Um, his one line was a joke. Um, <laughs> yeah, it, it was close to his only line in the movie. Um, so, uh, so let me let me talk about like a couple of the the really cheap aspects of the production i noticed yeah um i think that oh, like this movie was like reshot a ton i think there was like two or three sets of reshoots with this movie um in, in like extensive reshoots at that um <laughs> so the ending climax hinges on a bit of information just sort of gets dropped in our lap out of nowhere where it's like eh, mutants are bad so we decided to open internment camps I'm like, yeah wait hold up 
where, <laughs> when, what, how, what's going on here? And so you get you get that, and then immediately they have like power disabling collars because that was a thing from X Men Three, I think. Mm. And it was just sort of like, what? Okay, I guess we have like all this stuff that just sort of came out of nowhere because we had a train set for some reshoots. And we needed to get you there. And so it doesn't matter where the train's going. What matters is that they're on a train to go somewhere and they don't get there. Instead, we have an action scene. Uh, that's the important part. And so, uh, but then also, like, the part where Hank goes to talk to Magneto on what I, I guess is Genosha, um, like, there's a scene where, and the blocking in shot setup's really bad. Like, the very creative blocking is two people standing perfectly still looking at each other. And the, the very creative shot setup is shot reverse shot. And so, but like when it cuts back to beast, he's out of focus, like very subtly out of focus. And so it was just one of those things where I'm like, like that had to be a reshoot, right? Where Mm -hmm. we needed to film this really, really fast. So we have like no blocking and like barely what constitutes as a shot setup and just had the act read their lines and we didn't even, like, get it all in focus. Like, that was crazy to me. Uh, there was one shot I noticed that I also thought was kind of out of, like, weirdly. It wasn't out of focus, but it was after, spoilers, Mystique dies. Um, it was right after she gets stabbed. Uh, which, by the way, okay, the first X-Men movie, she gets stabbed in the chest by Wolverine and lives. In this, <laughs> she gets thrown onto a piece of metal. And the first thing I thought was, it's a good thing Mystique can survive that. And then she doesn't. <laughs> And I'm like, what? Why? And anyway. Well, well uh, Rebecca Romaine had a full contract ahead of her. Uh, okay, and and Jennifer <laughs> Lawrence clearly does not care. Like, uh, apparently she didn't even want to come and do this one, but she was just like, yeah, I guess I owe it to the fans to... But, um, yeah, so... But then, like, Beast is, like, cradling her dead body, and, like, the camera is more focused on Mystique's hair than it is on Mystique... Uh, on Beast, like, crying. Yeah. Like, yeah. Uh, like, you see his chin... And maybe a tear coming down, but you don't get to see him emoting, which is already hard. Like, props to Nicholas Holt, because he's in Beast makeup at that point. And, I, I mean, these movies have a weird tendency of saying that Beast is like the Hulk, and he can just go back and forth whenever he wants. But, yeah. <laughs> like, that would have been the time to do it. Like, have him go back into Nicholas Holt mode and then cry, because he's something sad has happened. But, A, they keep him in Beast makeup, and, B, they've got the camera focused on Mystique's hair. Um, yeah, yeah, it, it's a. I noticed that too. That was bizarre. Um, but yeah, so there, you you had some more things about production. I was just that was the big one that I noticed that. Actually no, that's took me good. Because the that's bringing me to my next point of bad wigs. <laughs> um, oh yeah, Speak's wig is bad. Like I thought it was kind of starting to look bad in like Apocalypse, but you ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> dun dun, b- 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 baby ain't nothing. So, like, and then at the beginning, Charles Xavier's wig's really bad. Um, I don't know, like, it's weird, like, bad wigs are, like, a weird thing, because, like, you don't know, like, a lot of that just kind of comes down to, like, what you know about the actor, so I don't know if I thought the wigs looked bad, because I knew that Professor, or uh, Charles Xavier, or, oh my god, James, James McAvoy. McAvoy, I was really worried I was going to say Professor Charles McAvoy, <laughs> um, or James Xavier, or something, um, so, so he... I know he's bald in real life because he's been doing these movies and he's been doing um, this, yeah, the, the weird M. Night Shyamalan movies. And so he's been like keeping that shaven and he also like was doing that throughout the filming of Victor Frankenstein uh, from like that came out in 2015. Um, so like, he's yeah, been going with the shaved head for a while. And, and so I just, in my head, that's how I see him right now. And so seeing him with long hair, but at the same time, I think he had that shorter hair when when days of future past was coming out mm-hmm. but that was a wig too but it didn't look nearly as weak as it's like the, the opening scene like the way the the hair just sort of like naturally falls just doesn't just doesn't look like real hair um, right. and then like look i know some people are really liking this musical score if you like this musical score i'm happy like i'm glad you like it i could barely stand this musical score um, and I was shocked when I saw that Hans Zimmer did it. Yeah. Because most of it, okay, so we get like the like the main theme a lot up front, right, and a little bit at the end, and it sounds like his Inception score, but bad, where it's like stripped down, 
and more kind of restrained and less bombastic and, and just sort of kind of be more majestic. But it, it just sounds like his Inception music. And then here is the, the rest of the music in Dark Phoenix. <laughs> It's just a droning synth. That's the music, and like, good movies don't have musical scores like that. And like, I, 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 that's a weird thing to say. I know, and I, I'm not dogging on anybody who has a synth score. Like movies like like Drive's a great movie, has a synth score. Lots of like John Carpenter has made tons of great movies. They all have synth scores, but like, I've seen so many movies that are cheap, and they come out in January. And they're trying to like ha- like have some kind of ambiance because the director isn't very experienced, so he doesn't know how to create it with like a tone or an atmosphere just quite yet. And uh, so they'll have like a droning synth on the score, and it, and it just it just maybe I'm just pre-programmed to feel that way, and, and maybe I'm not being objective or what have you, but like I couldn't believe that was the music I was listening to in this, and I, I think that probably added to like the weird dour tone as well. So. Yeah, um, I, I was also surprised that Hans Zimmer did this because he was supposed to have retired, and I'm not, I'm not like, you know, <laughs> why didn't you stay in retirement, Zimmer? I'm not like that, but, like, he said he was retired, and then Simon Kimberg, air quotes, convinced him to come onto this. I He must have blackmail on him, uh, and then it was, well, while I'm in retirement, I might as or while I'm out of retirement, I might as well go do Wonder Woman 84, so uh, you may get some, <laughs> some fantastic music in that also. Um yeah, um, the music, like, what when you have, at best, like, for me, I'm, usually, I don't really pick up on, like, oh, hey, that score was not great. Usually, though, like, I, I can give a compliment to a movie if I can say I honestly did not notice the music. Um, like, that sounds bad, but usually if I don't notice it, it's like, okay, you like, good job. There are a few superhero movies, I can think of, like, five, where it's like, I remember the musical score, um in a good way but this one it's not in a good way like i remember it and i wish i didn't yeah um so i think the worst aspect of this movie is jessica chastain's character and her whole side plot uh why don't don't you explain what that is well i mean i've never seen her act in anything i know you you've probably seen some stuff i was looking and like i remember when Zero Dark Thirty came out, and I remember everyone in the in the world saying that that was like a fantastic movie, and I'm assuming she acted well in it. She's just a robot in this, and I guess that's what they're going for because in the first like two minutes of her performance, she's not a robot. Like she puts more emotion into a woman going out to check on her dog than she does in, <laughs> in the rest of the movie. And like, okay, so I guess first of all, like I was kind of surprised that it wasn't uh, Lil Andra and the She Are. Because I remember as soon as they announced that Jessica Chastain was going to be in this, everyone was like, oh, it's the Shi'ar Empire. Because they are a part of the Dark Phoenix saga in the comics. And then it wasn't. It was actually the other aliens from the Dark Phoenix saga. So I don't know if you know this, but way back in Avengers issue 4, this was the issue that brings Captain America out of the ice in the Silver Age of Marvel comics. Um, There's this alien going around turning people into stone. And then Captain America finds him, and it turns out he looks like a broccoli, sort of. And, like, fans call this alien race the Dabari. They call them the broccoli people now. Um, but, like, <laughs> their their name, are they are the Dabari. And, anyway, this thing, he had, like, a, a ray gun that could turn people into stone. And then he gives it, he undoes what he's done, and then they help him get to his home planet. Well, then, like, 20-something years later, they're doing the Dark Phoenix saga. And uh, Chris Claremont, he writes that Jean Grey goes and she eats a star. And that's, like, all he writes in the script. And then John Byrne says, I've got a better idea. What if it's an inhabited star system? And she kills billions of people when she eats the star. And so he, like, digs through his comic collection, I guess, and finds the Dabari guy from that one issue of Avengers. And then he draws that alien species getting annihilated by Gene. So that's the species that we get here. Like, the, <laughs> the Dabari – and, again, it, in the same way that, like, you wouldn't know that that's Genosha – uh, in one line of dialogue, uh, Jessica Chastain mentions, this is what the Dabari have come to. And I don't know what's going on here, because we see some alien spaceships land on Earth, and then we hear the dog barking, and then these people are having a party out in their patio, and then she goes to check on the dog. I guess an alien either possesses her or kills her and then assumes her shape, and I guess they're shape-shifting aliens. But some of the Dabari have been part of Earth society for years. Because there's one of them who is working at the White House. 
And so I don't know if these guys just came to Earth or if they've been on Earth for a while. Uh, maybe the guy who was working at the White House, maybe there was another guy working at the White House and then a Dabari like took his form. Um, but basically, years ago, the Phoenix Force, which was a cosmic force, destroyed their, their home planet and has destroyed everything since then except for Gene. For some reason, uh, it likes Gene, and it takes Gene, and like they, it, they get together. And so now Jessica Chastain wants to control Gene, but then later she says, I'll just take the power from you since you don't like it. And Gene is like, okay. And then she starts taking the power, and then Gene turns them all into sand. And uh, I don't know. Like, I, I don't know what's going on there because um, – I don't know how long the Phoenix Force has been going around, which, by the way, there are people on the Internet now complaining, and they are making a very valid complaint, that Jean Grey busts out the Phoenix Force at the end of X-Men Apocalypse. Uh, when they defeat Apocalypse, yes. she uses the Phoenix Force. And then in this, she contracts the Phoenix Force like it's a disease at the beginning of this movie. So, um, and I, like, Brian Singer does not like the more cosmic stuff of the X-Men. He likes to keep things pretty grounded. He doesn't even like, like, you know, he would probably have a conniption like a caesar if he saw that there was yellow in their costumes here because <laughs> like he just wants it all to be just black costumes and nothing exciting or interesting um and so like i guess simon kimberg was like well you know i'll just kind of do it differently than it than we did it the last time you know in x-men 3 we had charles xavier like gene gray is like this sinister little omen kid and so charles like represses that and creates a fake gene gray and then that gets broken and then that's the dark phoenix here, they're trying to do that, but they're also trying to do a cosmic thing. Like, there's a cosmic space bird that possesses Jean, but then there's also Charles messing with Jean's mind and telling her that her parents are dead when actually her dad is still alive. It's trying to have its awful cake and eat it, too. <laughs> yeah, um, so... I, I never thought I'd say these words. Jessica Chastain gave a bad performance. Mm -hmm. Um... I didn't think that was possible. Um, I think she is straddled with a boring character, and she is told to act boring. And well, I guess she's a professional. She did what she was told. <laughs> um, and, and it is just one of those those like bizarre, like what kind of moments where it is just this whole subplot is is weird. Where so they're shape shifting aliens who are coming because we need to have everyone to team up and fight against at the end but like it, it feels so like on a production level cheap like you don't <laughs> I, I keep saying this and i'm sorry if this is annoying people but like in good movies you don't have that scene where like she gets out of the car and talks to the people on the rooftop like that's something out of a tv show like how come these shape-shifting aliens never are in their native form except for the very dark out of focus shots when we first see them mm -hmm. because they need to save some money. So what are they wearing at the end? Well, they're wearing like business suits and casual wear and track suits, workout gear. Like it was like watching a TV movie on like Fox. Mm. <laughs> like it, it was like shocking to me. Like this, this is what, are you kidding me? Like, this is ridiculous. Like I, I don't even necessarily need like this crazy big over the top. Like just, Give me some aliens that look like aliens. <laughs> like I don't know. Like it was. It, it felt. This felt like what we would have gotten in 2006 when when the Last Stand came out. Mm -hmm. Like this feels exactly like the kind of movie where if we just like got rid of uh, the Cure storyline and weren't worried about trying to you know be a hot commodity. Like what what if X Men Two bombed? But sorry, not bombed. But like it. It didn't do. It wasn't as successful as they had hoped it was, but they were so able to make a third one to wrap everything up. This is probably what we would have gotten. It it feels like, anyways. Um, uh, and and uh, like like so, Jessica Chastain has these powers, right? Where she can like, I guess she's also telekinetic even before she has any uh, uh like Phoenix in her mind or something. You know what I mean? Where yeah. she's able to like twist her wrist and you see like the person's like like rib cage twist in on itself mm -hmm. yeah she does that to uh gene's dad and then she's, yeah. i guess she does that to the husband of the woman whose form she took um, yeah none of the other guys have those powers i don't think 
And why did she do it later in the movie? Like, it is just a weird thing that she just has those powers. And, like, that felt like a network TV show power where we need to show you that she's powerful. Oh, she can do this crazy thing. And then so we can establish her as a threat and then we never bring it up again because we don't need it anymore. Like, it is such a weird thing that, like, good movies don't have stuff like that in there. And and why does she kill Gene's dad? Like, she asks him a question, right, of, like, hey, I need to, you to tell me everything about Charles Xavier, the mutant you gave her to. I need to know everything. And then he's like, no, I'm not going to say anything. And then she's like, well, I'm going to kill you anyways. And so she just kills him. But it's like, it's implied that he didn't tell her anything more. Mm-hmm. So they just killed him without getting all the information they needed. That just makes him look dumb. Yeah. Um, yeah, this... I, I think that they were... I don't know. Like, I'd, I'd love to... Like, this is one of those movies... Like, I, right now, I'm reading this book that came out in about 2006 that's about all the behind-the-scenes drama of pretty much everything Superman outside of the comics up until the book came out. So, like, all the, like, you know writing problems and casting problems and stuff of the Superman movies, the cartoons, the radio show, all that stuff. It's just a whole book about that. I would love to see a book about this movie. Like, what was the script like when it first came out? What was the movie like when before they did any reshoots? And then second reshoots, third reshoots. I'd love to know all of that because the Dabari seems so undeveloped that I really am curious if they were even supposed to be the main threat at first. Um... Like, I remember uh, this would have been last year, I think, and I double-checked on Twitter to see if that was still there, but, like, Comic Book Resources had posted a picture of Michael Fassbender, like, on his knees, and behind him is uh, Storm, Nightcrawler, Beast, and then a couple of those other no-name mutants that were part of Genosha. And it said, like, Magneto gets a new brotherhood in this trailer for Dark Phoenix, and I never saw the trailer, so I I don't know what, you know, if there was anything in those trailers that wasn't in this movie, but... I'm really, like, based on how little Magneto does here, and based on how they've been shoving him into every movie in these in this franchise, I'm really thinking that originally he was more of a threat, and the aliens probably weren't even there. Yeah, because I think, you know, like, I, I, I earlier said there's no reason for Magneto to be in this movie. I think what they do contrive for him ain't bad, but because of the aliens, he's warranted obsolete. Yeah. And so... Like, his whole vengeance thing, it's something kind of different than what we're used to. Um, And, you know, him wanting to kill a mutant is kind of new. Like, that's been completely against anything that we've really seen before. Um, And, uh, you know, Michael Fassbender is doing what he can with the acting. And, and, uh, man, it's it's just a strange movie. And you're right. Like, it feels like it's been reworked so many times. Like, just little things like... Like I said earlier, but like, oh, we've we've uh, we're doing mutant internment camps now, and then also bigger things like the inclusion of the aliens and how they kind of negate Magneto as a threat, and it's it is just kind of all over the place. Um, it does feel like a screenwriter who has never directed a film before made Speak, this. Speaking of, uh, Simon Kinberg is a screenwriter who has yes. never directed a film before. Um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you you look at his directing. History, he's directed an episode of The Twilight Zone, and that's it. And then he's got something else coming up that I'm not going to watch. Um, now, he's produced a lot of stuff, and, you know, you could flip a coin, and 50-50 chance he's produced something you've liked and produced something you hated. Um, he did that fan stick movie that was just an abysmal train wreck, even worse than this, really. But then he's also, like, he was involved with some of the early Brian Singer X-Men movies that we kind of liked. Um, so, you know, it's kind of... I'm I'm really curious, like, this is him doing this. Like, you know, with Fan Stick, you can blame the studio for, you know, locking out Josh Trank, or you can blame Josh Trank, or you can, you know, blame whoever. This is him. Like, this is Simon Kimberg writing and directing. So, like, I, I don't think there's really... We can't spread the blame around much more. Yeah, um, I, I agree. But, but <clears throat> so when a screenwriter writes a screenplay... I think you you know this quote. It's, it's a Max Landis quote where he said, like, you're not writing a movie, you're writing a screenplay. Yeah. And uh, so I, I think Simon Kinberg's episode of The Twilight Zone, he 
he probably directed after or during <laughs> him directing this movie. Um, and and I I think that the lack of experience really shows. And even then, like an episode of the, of the Twilight Zone, it's an episode of television. Mm-hmm. Like it, it, it's a very big step from that to this. And um, the the uh, the reworking of it does feel like a screenwriter. Like I know how I can rewrite this and all that, but like the directorial, like there's there's lulls in the direction and other parts that aren't nearly as lully. And I I don't want to like I, I, my heart goes out to the guy. Like he was obviously in a really kind of crazy situation. Um, where it's not an ideal situation. And I, I think he probably did the best he possibly could have. But, like, you have scenes like the train scene, which is better directed than the rest of the movie. It's not a poorly directed sequence at all. But then you have, like, what we were talking about earlier, where certain shots are just either out of focus or focused on the wrong thing. Mm-hmm. And uh, there's a general cheapness that just permeates the whole production where skies are blown out and black levels are blown out and they're not like dark and and it just feels really cheap and and there's like weird short scenes that like scenes do absolutely nothing but progress one part of the story and and then it's like there's not really like a, like i don't know let's, let's talk about like a joss whedon avengers movie right mm-hmm. where we need to by the end of the scene this needs to be accomplished but getting there is fun you know what i mean and, and they'll have like like a uh some kind of joke that kind of goes throughout the whole scene, or they'll have some kind of character dynamic that they'll, uh, that they'll unveil throughout that you didn't notice before. So we're accomplishing multiple things in one scene and it's not just obligatorily get this one thing out of the way. This felt like the latter where each scene does feel like I got to get this thing out of the way. And it it, it feels like it's directed with screenwriter sensibilities. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and and that's that's unfortunate because like we were saying like they didn't know this was going to be the swan song of the Fox X Men movies, but even if you didn't know that, you still want to put your best effort into making a movie. Like, you know, if you didn't like, it's almost like if they had known this was going to be the last one, that they would have tried a little harder. But you want them to try hard anyway, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so. One thing I like that I, I, I should have mentioned this earlier when we were talking about positives were were you did you have anything else you wanted to say about that? Oh no, continue. continue. Um, so you know we mentioned that like none of the characters get to do anything. Like Magneto doesn't even show up until till halfway into the movie, and then like you said, he's doing the best he can, but like his character feels pretty obsolete. Uh, most of the X Men don't get to do anything. I do like that Beast gets to do something. Um, for the last couple of movies, I felt like he was kind of just there, especially in Apocalypse. Like. I just recently, a couple weeks ago, watched all of the X-Men movies except for the Deadpool ones, and uh, I felt like Beast was, like, in Apocalypse, he was in the movie. I know that, but I don't remember anything that he gets to do. And um, Days of Future Past is a little better because he gets to talk to Logan about how Professor X, you know, fell down the hole and stuff, but, like, he doesn't get a whole lot to do other than push around Charles in a chair. And so I'm glad that he has some agency in this movie. Um, It's a little weird that he's, like goes to Magneto hoping that he can manipulate Magneto into killing Jean and then he becomes the headmaster of the school at the end. That that's a little yeah. odd. Like you don't want that guy around your children. Um, you know, what if what if one of the kids accidentally scratches the plane? Is he gonna kill the kid? Like is he, is he gonna send Nightcrawler to kill the kid? Like um, <laughs> Um, by the way, it was really funny that on his desk at the end there's a picture of Mystique, but it's like a production still from this movie. <laughs> yeah, and she she has the most like, oh, they're about to take a picture, half smile, like, mm. yeah. it, it didn't look like she was happy at all. It was like a TMZ, like, gotcha! Yeah. <laughs> um, it it would have been great if they could have, if that picture could have been like the two of them from first class, like, you know, yeah, back when exactly. we were kids and we didn't know any better. Um uh, he, but he gets some good acting moments in this movie. Like, uh, there, there's one moment where Sophie Turner, Sophie Turner and Nicholas Holt are both British, okay? And I, I like to give the Brits a lot of props because nine times out of ten, when they are playing our American icons, they do a really good job with the voice. Like Christian Bale, you watch the Batman movies, you would never know that he's from the UK. Uh, Henry Cavill, same thing. Uh, there is one moment for both Sophie Turner and Nicholas Holt where they lose their accent just for a little bit. 
and I, I notice. And if I notice, then other people notice. I don't know if, if you notice, but, like, Sophie Turner is close to the beginning of the movie. It's, uh, like, right after they came back from space, and she's talking to Scott. And I don't even remember what the line was, but I remember thinking, ooh, there's a little bit of British in there. And, <laughs> and then uh, Nicholas Holt, it was when he was yelling at Charles, like, he throws the beer and uh, or throws the whiskey or whatever. And he said something, and I was – and. I guess it's hard, maybe, like if you're if you're trying to do an American accent and you're also trying to emote and make it sound like you're crying, it's going to be hard to do that. But like I noticed a little bit right there. Oh wait, you're not American. I forgot about that. Yeah. Um, so I don't like what we do with Beast in this movie, mm -hmm. but I do think Nichols Holt does a pretty good job. Um, that scene with him and Charles in the in the kitchen. It's a uh, it's pretty well acted all around. And, you know, James McAvoy is one of my favorite actors in the business right now. He's, he's great. Uh, I also don't like what we do with Xavier, but, um, but with, with, uh, with Beast. So, so Masique dies and. She's one of the lucky ones. She gets yeah. that early. So I'm just thinking in terms of like, so there was a part where she's standing in front of the X-Men, like, plane, standing completely still, saying, go, 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 get in there. Mm -hmm. And then she's sitting down in the cockpit, and then she's, like, standing next to, like, a monitor in that scene where she's talking with Beast about leaving. Like, Jennifer Lawrence didn't, like, move at all in this movie. <laughs> the one scene where she walked, she got killed. <laughs> oh, man. Um, uh, anyway, I just I just thought of that. Uh, so 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 she dies, and then Nicholas Holt is angry about it, and then she's he's so angry about it he's gonna try to get Magneto to kill Dark Phoenix. Like I this all sort of makes sense from like like I can understand why somebody would think this is a good idea in concept where they're like, oh it's soap operatic, you know the person's being over the top and reactionary because her best friend died. But, like, based on the movies that I've seen that lead up to this, I really don't buy that he'd do that. Mm -mm. Um, and it just makes him look like a real bad guy. Yeah. Um, he he stuck with Charles when Charles was, like, probably shooting up heroin and all the school, you know, all the kids went to Vietnam and stuff. Like, And now it's like, this is what, like, and, and, you know, Charles has a good point where he's like, you know, my, she was my foster sister. And, like, we just put her in the ground and you're yelling at me for it. Like, it, it's a... In a better movie, this would have been a really fascinating dichotomy between these two. I agree, yeah. And and these movies, you know, we, we were talking about how the first, the previous three are the Beginnings trilogy. Almost all these movies like to pretend like the other movies don't exist until they need them to. Like, you know, <laughs> this one mentions like, you know, hey, we're the only ones of the first class now available <laughs> on Blu-ray and DVD. Uh, <laughs> like, that, like, you know, we're the only ones left and... uh I was thinking, like, you know, yeah, like, the last of them died ten years ago. Like, you know, and and by the way, like, I guess the X-Men only have adventures once every ten years. Like, Yeah, I guess so. I, I don't know. Like, I've never really been a huge fan of the jumping forward in time motif that these have been doing. Like, way back when First Class first came out, I was thinking, you know, you could make an entire trilogy set in the 60s, and there'd be enough material there. Like, you don't have to move that fast, and, that like, you don't have to move forward that quickly. But anyway, um... But, yeah, like, this movie kind of sort of mentions, like, you know, hey, like, they all died. And, like, Mystique is horrible. She says, um, you know, you, when was the last time you had to sacrifice something, Charles? I was thinking, he's in a wheelchair because your boyfriend shot him with a bullet. Like, what do you expect of him? Like, do you expect him to go into outer space and rescue astronauts like that? Like, what? And, and oh, man, like, now I'm, I, I'm starting to branch off in all these different territories. I'm trying to not lose track of one train of thought. Uh, talk about Charles Xavier for a minute, like, you know, what's wrong with the problematic stuff with him. So, so you, you, I'm going to get to him in a second, but you had brought up, like, the time jumping thing. I want to get into that. Uh, it sort of was bothering me in Apocalypse. It's really bothering me now. Like, why does Hank McCoy, who's probably in his, like, 50s now, why does he look like he's five years older than Sophie Turner? <laughs> I, I think in First Class he mentions, you know, oh, Mystique, you, you're shape-shifting, like, you'll never age. And then he injects himself with that. So I guess that's why he doesn't age. Um, okay. Okay. That, 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 that's a good one. How come... Uh, everyone uh, else? Literally Michael everyone Michael Fassbender else. Uh, is like eight years away from being Ian McKellen, yet he has absolutely no gray hairs. Yeah. Fair point. Yeah. Um, 
they, they <laughs> this, especially this movie, but most of these movies, you could have at least Days of Future Past. I'm not a fan of that movie, but at least that one makes a plot point about how, like, you know, the Vietnam War happened and, like, it kind of destroyed all the stuff that we thought we were going to be able to do. But, like, X-Men Apocalypse, there's no reason that movie had to be set in the 80s. That could have been set no. three years after Days of Future Past. This movie could have been set three years after X-Men Apocalypse. Like, the time jumps is just, they're inconsequential. Like, especially this one. At least in the others, you know, they're like, hey, pop culture references. Like, you know, this one is just, if it didn't have 1992 on the screen, you really wouldn't know when it's set. Exactly, yeah. No, and, and the time periods, like, I was disappointed by how little 80s we got in Apocalypse because I, I know you don't like Days of Future Past a whole lot. I love that movie. And a lot of that probably comes down to I just love the way the 70s look. Mm -hmm. I love, like, like, like uh, Wolverine with the leather jacket and the bell-bottom pants with the big belt buckle and the aviator shades. Awesome. Yes. Uh, like, I, I love the fashion of the 70s. I like the, the kind of dirty look of the 70s. I like the cars. I like, I, I just really love the way the 70s looked. And, uh, and, and that movie made such a great use of it. It's like, okay, we're going to jump ahead, uh, you know, one decade, but we're going to, like, make use out of it. And then, like, the, the thought process behind Apocalypse, and this is just sort of like, well, I mean, we did it last time. Mm hmm uh, we just do it this time now, I guess. So it, it's just a weird, weird thing. And so, what? Like, oh my God! Like, why? Why? Like, how old is Quicksilver? I don't know. So, anyways, uh, and then furthermore, how old are Jean and Cyclops? Because it's like they realize that Alexandra Ship, who plays Storm, Ty Sheridan, and Jean or uh, Sophie Turner, they realize they and Cody Smith McPhee, they realize they look like kids. So the only other kids at the X Mansion we see are, like, little kids, like, yeah. eight-year-olds, and that was so weird. Um, and we get, well, we get two scenes with them, I guess. Like, I was going to say, like, man, this, this movie really suffers from being short. Like, you know, because there's one scene where Cyclops, and I don't know if Cyclops and Gene are teachers or if they are just field X-Men. Because, like, at one point, Cyclops is, like, running through the school, like, Beast isn't in class! And it's like, okay, maybe he's in the restroom, <laughs> calm down. But, um, <laughs> but, like, you know, I don't know, like, does Scott teach gym? Does he teach shop? Like, you know, I don't know what he does. And at the end of the movie, we see uh, that he, uh, we see Storm uh, is in uh, class, do like, shooting lightning bolts from her hands. So I guess she's teaching how to shoot lightning bolts from her hands. But, uh I don't know, like, and then there's one other scene where they're all outside throwing, like, bombs in the fire or something. I don't know. Like, they, you you could almost be forgiven for thinking that this is a school, or, or for not realizing this is a school, because you spend so little time with the premise that this is mutants at a school. Yeah. Um, by the way, who's who's the the mutant who's also a pop star? Uh, Dazzler. Yeah, she's, she's in this movie. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean... I've never been just the biggest fan of Dazzler, but I, I, I thought, hey, that's that's cool. They're they're throwing in fan service. It's kind of like when we were talking about Godzilla last week, where you were saying like, you know, there's fan service, but you could remove it and the plot would be the same. Like you don't need the oxygen destroyer or stuff like that. Uh, I felt the same way, kind of like. But I'm I'm torn because sometimes I want fan service, and sometimes I'm just like, yeah, whatever. Like, I, I you could you could very easily remove Dazzler, and they apparently had a reference to her in Apocalypse that they removed from the theatrical cut, so I guess, I don't know if that's even canon now, I, I don't know, um, but then, like, you know, they were mentioning, uh, we were taking these mutants to an internment camp, and I got real excited for a minute, because you know how I love internment camps, but, uh, I'm just <laughs> kidding, kidding, uh, <laughs> that was, that was dark, I'm sorry, uh, but in, in the... It was so random, too, I loved it. <laughs> In uh, the original Days of Future Past comic, it's jumping back and forth between the present day, which is like 1980 or 81, and then 2013. And in 2013, you've got uh, Storm, Colossus, uh, adult Franklin Richards, uh, this girl who, like, years later you find out is Rachel Summers, and then uh, Kitty Pride or Kate Pride, and then Magneto is in a wheelchair. And I, I was getting real excited for a minute, like, you know, hey, we're going to get to see them do something kind of like that, where, like, they're all going to be wearing the orange outfits, and they're going to have, like, the M on it, kind of like in Days of Future Past. And then we don't even get to the internment camp, which is fine, because, like, I, I'm torn between this movie needed to be longer to give the characters more to do, and thank goodness that it ended when it did so that I could get out of there. Um, but I, I do think 
you could have done like the uh, instead of having the final act be on the train, you could have had it be at the internment camp. And then, like, you could still have the same stuff, where the mutants are trying to convince the guards, hey, take these collars off of us, and we can help you. And then, like, maybe you get a scene where, you know, Magneto and Storm are running from the alien people, and they can't use their powers, so they have to be creative and, you know, do other stuff. I think there's something you could have done there, maybe. Uh, perhaps, but at the same time, how many mutants would possibly be in that internment camp in, like, two hours? Oh, not many. You know, it'd basically be the ones that were on the train. You're right. Um... Uh, so I guess I'll talk about Charles Xavier now. I don't, I don't know what the movie wants me to think of him, and it's it's so weird because like he's kind of acting cocky and kind of obnoxious at the beginning of the movie, uh, and, and and he's not really talking to his the people around him, but at the same time I don't exactly know what he's doing that's so wrong that's making people this upset. Like you know what I'm saying? Like like when it came to like he blocked out childhood trauma from from uh uh, uh sophie turner <laughs> jean gray um i was thinking oh yeah that's a that's a pretty bad thing to do um it might have been like you know i don't know i just feel like it's it's weird because i could also see this exact same movie where she turned 20 years old and then he said gene there's something i need to tell you if he got, like got ahead of the reveal then everything would have been fine but because he didn't, now he's a dirt, dirt bag. You know what I'm saying? Like it's mm-hmm. just like this weird thing that any like the viewer can draw their own ethical conclusion. And there's probably a really great argument to be made that him suppressing her trauma robbed her of like some kind of identity and like all that. So like all that arguments. I'm just saying like in terms of the movie they made, it just feels like the argument they're constructing is very arbitrary. Like mm-hmm. if he told her what he did like three years ago, I don't know why he didn't. But if he did, then like you know, he's a fine, he's still fine, but because he didn't, then now it's coming to bite him in the butt. Now he's a really bad guy. I don't know. And furthermore, like, I thought this would lead to he suppressed even more emotions. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But he didn't. It was just that one time. And it was just sort of like one of those things where I'm like, I don't, I'm like the, the big dramatic weight of just how horrible he's been is kind of lost on me. You know what I'm saying? And, and, uh, and I, I was, I was just thinking like, okay, She's like he suppressed these this this one um, experience from her, and so then I was thinking, okay, I wonder what the Phoenix Force like what that's gonna do, how that's gonna change her, and it doesn't really change Jean. It just says, oh, this traumatic thing, it it really happened, and then her dad's mean to her, uh, I think needlessly so. Like it's such a weird thing. I'll get into that in a second, but then like, so 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 she flips out and just starts going nuts and kills Mystique all, all just because of like her mom died and mm-hmm. she might have been responsible and yeah that's a really sad thing I don't I, like the problem is I don't understand Jean nearly enough to understand why she specifically would freak this bad out about it mm-hmm. and so and that just comes down to I don't know these characters and this movie is as you keep saying it's too short it's way too short and they maybe they could have if they were really set on well this needs to be two hours long then you need to cut something because like either cut the charles xavier removed uh you know told her her parents were dead when they weren't or or when her dad wasn't dead remove that or remove the alien subplot like it's it's the same problem that x-men the last stand had where they were trying to do the dark phoenix storyline and the cure storyline and it was too much in a short amount of time this is doing the same thing. It's not the cure, but now it's two separate things, and you can take one or the other and make a better movie out of it. Um, you know, you could do a movie where Charles Xavier is responsible for Jean for, for suppressing her since childhood, and then something happens that knocks her loose, and then she realizes it, and then everyone is like, Charles, you butthead, why'd you do that? And then, like, she goes off and starts killing people, and it's his fault. You could do that, or... You could not do that, and then you could have the aliens be responsible. But they're trying to do both, and in such a short amount of time, neither one works. Uh, yeah, I, I agree. Um, um, do you? What is your? Because like, I'm I'm kind of torn. Like sometimes I really like Charles Xavier being the ultimate good, where he's just like can do no wrong, and he helps everyone, <laughs> and he's just a really nice father figure. 
sometimes I like him like that, and then sometimes I want him to be more developed, and I want him to be more of a character and less of a uh, less of an icon. Um, and so in that case, I don't mind whenever he does morally reprehensible stuff for the greater good. Uh, you know, he'll uh, erase someone's memories uh, like, uh, you know, I, no, that's not a good example. I was thinking of like in X2, like whenever uh, Pyro and Bobby are kind of, you know, Pyro's goofing off and lights the guy on fire, and then Charles Xavier like freezes everyone in the mall. Like that's kind of a violation of privacy, but, you know, it's for the greater good so that they all don't all get arrested. Um, so this is a guy who can do bad things, but he thinks it's for the good of mutants. Uh, I'm kind of torn because I like that idea, but unfortunately it comes off as really hypocritical whenever he's over here talking about how mutants need to be, you know, we want to coexist with humans, but then he does all this stuff and we don't have enough room to explore that. Uh, even in a good movie that had the runtime it needed, we don't have enough time to explore that. Like, this needed to be like an ongoing television series that lasted like eight seasons uh, for us to explore what kind of person Charles Xavier is, that he does bad things, but he is the head of the angels, if you will. Yeah, well, <clears throat> I think another thing is, like, the time jump really hurts this movie because, and its its status quo is shifted so much where it doesn't feel, like, connected to the last three movies at all. It just, it feels more like I'm supposed to take it on its own <clears throat> than, like, say, the last two movies, right? Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and I think some of that does come down to the title. It's like, it's not X-Men Dark Phoenix, it's just Dark Phoenix. And I think that's a that's probably a smart title because it doesn't really feel connected to the other X-Men movies. Um, so so Charles, like, it, it's weird because, like, he has achieved a lot, but they don't say any of that's been good. But it has been good. Like, he's, like, been doing a lot. And he has, like, a really good argument where he's saying, like, like we needed to put ourselves at risk to, like, save the humans because... If just like the wrong person dies, or even one person dies on a mission, that's gonna fall on us. It shouldn't, but it's going to. And like the humans are like really, really fragile. They will turn on us in an instant. Like we all know this. Why am I having to inform you on this, Jennifer Lawrence? Like, but you know, we need her to make a big argument and then die so that everyone <laughs> is mad that she's dead. So, um, oh yeah. my god. And then and then like what happens is. The second anything bad happens, they open internment camps and they're putting them in a train. There should have been a scene on a train where Charles was like, hey, guys, remember when I said the humans would turn on us if anything <laughs> bad happened? Look what just happened. Like, he was right. Like, it, it's weird where it's like there is a story, like, right here to be made about, like, Charles is maybe doing morally reprehensible things. But, like, they also put in all this other stuff that they're telling us to not pay attention to where it's like, no, Charles has actually done a lot of good things too, and mm -hmm. they don't acknowledge any of the good things. And it almost feels like, uh, like the ending where he's retired is sort of played off as I, you know, it, it's like the the Harvey Dent thing of like I I lived long enough to see myself become the villain, so I need to retire. I'm like, but what what did you do? <laughs> like, I don't, mm -hmm. you know, it's it's just weird. And he, like, he really is put in between a rock and a hard place. We we should have had a scene where Charles said. What, put yourself in my shoes. What would you have done, Hank? Like, this girl says my parents are dead. Do you, A, well, your mom is dead and it's all your fault, you little brat. <laughs> B, uh, your dad is still alive and he wants nothing to do with you. Uh, do you want to come live at my school? It's a castle. Like, you know, what? what's he supposed to do? Like, he, he does something kind of bad, but I don't see that he has any other options. Um, or just tell I mean, the dad, like, be a better parent. Sorry, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to get in the middle of this. You need to work this out with your daughter. Yeah, and then and, and then furthermore, like, what he should have done is, like, been like, hey, I, I, Gene, I haven't been entirely honest with you your whole life. There are things that I need to tell you. And maybe tell her this when she's, like, 16, you know? Mm -hmm. And then say, but the truth, I will have to tell you in time. You're not ready yet. You know what I'm saying? Then she can brood and be angsty about it. And then, you know, how, you know, but then that's your fun. That's your fun soap opera stuff, right? Like, I can see that where in like a Stanley comic where she's like, oh, he knows the truth, but he's not telling me. And, you know, like that's 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 good stuff. Like, it's OK for that to be there. Like she's she's earned the brooding. And then uh and then, you know, maybe when she's turned 20, say, look, here's what happened. But in this world, like, Sam, Simon Kinberg doesn't understand the nuances of, like, his characters hardly at all. Where it's like, oh, no, I just need Professor X to be this weird person who made a decision 20 years ago and then just kind of 
really sticks by it to like an alarming degree and then I guess just kind of forgets to ever like that 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 doesn't weigh on him at all and based on the Professor X of the last few movies I, I would have expected this to weigh on him more than it it ended up doing and it's just a weird treatment of the character yeah um and what sucks is like this could have been really interesting like it's not even that it's like oh you know we've been here before like yeah X-Men The Last Stand kind of touched on this there too but much like this movie, it didn't hardly explore it at all. So, like, this could have been fascinating, even though we have seen it before. Yeah, I I, I agree. Uh, so, I guess it was kind of satisfying that the Magneto helmet got broken. Mm-hmm. Um, Wait, they get a diff... Where is he getting all these helmets? Because that I, is... Right? <laughs> that's a... Like, in the first one, it's, it's like a gray and white kind of, and it's all shiny and it looks cool. And then in the second movie, it... Well, and then at the end of First Class, it's like, now he's painted it red and it's got devil horns. And then the end of, or in Days of Future, it's like all rusted and it looks like a different helmet. It and then looks in like Apoc- it's made of stone, yeah. Yeah, and then in Apocalypse, again, it looks different. Like, and I, then I, what's his face? Doesn't Apocalypse just make one out of thin air? Like, there you go. I think so, yeah. Maybe um, Apocalypse like, gave him like four to try on and this is one that he kept. <laughs> Man, that guy, he made me, he, he was crazy. He wanted to destroy the world, but at least he gave me these cool helmets. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I, and I was thinking, like, when he puts, he goes in and he, he gets the helmet out, and I was thinking, that works against Charles, or, like, when you're hiding against a telepath who's, like, on the other side of the planet, but, Char- like, Jane is telekinetic, and now she is, like, the most powerful mutant on the planet. She could just, like, pop that thing off your head. Like, th- how is that going to do you any good at all? Yeah, it looks kind of cool, but eh, mm-hmm. I don't know. Uh, the coolest part of this movie is when he pulled a subway up through the... Yeah. That part um, was cool. I like that. Um, I'm trying to think if... Um, I kind of like Ty Sheridan in this. Um, he doesn't get a whole lot to do, but he does the requisite, you know, Jane, like, you know, take, <laughs> take, a, take a drink. If you're reading or watching X-Men or, you know, listening to people talk about it on a podcast, like, take a, take a drink anytime someone yells Gene. Um, I mean, you'll do irreparable damage to your body, but it's a fun game to play. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I've never read a single page of an X Men comic, and even I know there's one like Cyclops' favorite word is G. <laughs> he and yeah. Wolverine share that for a certain period of time, right? Um, yeah. Um, I, this is, I guess, the first X Men movie that's really, really light on Wolverine. Like, I mean, the Deadpool movies will mention him or will like use stock footage of him but this is like our first wolverine-less x-men movie right yeah we get no cameos uh, there's also no post credit scene for anyone who's curious yeah I, I i looked that up beforehand i was like oh thank goodness i'm not staying through the credits of this movie yeah i was i was just thinking like man quicksilver was barely in this and also i read somewhere that choamba wumba was in this so <laughs> maybe it's maybe it's a post credits i don't know and then it wasn't there we go i, I just got trolled so um speaking uh you know earlier you said that charles should have said hey guys remember that time when i, I was just thinking like in, they're in the train they're all tied up and he should have said hey raven remember when i said oh oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> i'm just like yeah charles she's dead um i also saw someone who did a video um he, he's he's pretty popular on youtube he does the he works for screen rant and he does the pitch meeting videos where it's like a writer pitching a movie to a, a director or a a, a company guy and uh he did one for dark phoenix where it's like oh they named the school after gene shouldn't they name it after the woman that she murdered <laughs> and i was just thinking like yeah i mean i i was over jennifer lawrence as mystique like a while back but yeah like she got killed for nothing and then they named the school after gene like <laughs> that seems horrible so i thought that they were going to just straight up end it where ty sheridan comes and changes the sign mm-hmm I'm like, that's the end? Are you kidding me? <laughs> like, that felt like a reshoot, where it was just like, aim a camera, somebody changes the sign and walk away. It's not the end, so it didn't sting nearly as hard, but for a second there, I thought that was the final shot. Mm-hmm. I was like, what? That's it? Uh, but anyways, um, yeah, I don't know how much more I have to say about this. Um, I had really funny things that I had been thinking about at work, but I've forgotten now. So I might comment them in the comments below if I remember them. Yeah. Um, I. So one thing I was thinking of, and this is, again, showing that, well, especially now, but, like, they really haven't been planning very far ahead with these movies, but since Simon Kimberg was not involved with 
the story part of the last few movies, this is really evident, but remember how Days of Future Past was like, okay, we've got this garbage future where the Sentinels are, you know, taking over the planet and they're killing mutants and they're killing people who might become mutants and they're just killing all these people. And then Mystique does this good thing and then we get this awesome future where Scott and Jean are both alive and Beast is at the school and he's like, hey, hey, Logan, how you doing? And that's the future, right? Like, that's the future of this timeline. Yeah. And so then this movie happens, <laughs> and Gene dies, and now, like, Professor X is not there at the school, uh, which <laughs> may maybe he'll come back, I don't know. But, like, it seems like they, I, I don't know, I don't have anything clever to, add to end that with, just that they really don't know what they're doing. Like, they, no. they, were, they were telling us that this timeline it has a rosy ending, and now it's like, nope, just kidding, it's got a crappy ending. And, like, you know, they're probably, Sentinels will come back, or, you know, the Phalanx or something, something's coming back, and they're all going to die, and, like, the X-Men are doomed to just have a horrible future. <laughs> yeah, well, it's probably written by Simon Kinberg, and yeah. we'll never see it because it got canceled. Um, yeah, what a what a doozy. Mm -hmm. um, well, usually I like to ask, um, what what do you see in the future of a franchise we're, we're talking about? But since we're, th I'm going to say it, thankfully we're not going to get any more in this franchise unless they decide to release New Mutants, which at this point I don't know if they're going to. They keep pushing it further and further away. Like, ten years from now I'm going to say, hey, remember when we saw a trailer for that movie that never came out? Um, but do you, if they decide to bring X-Men into the MCU, what would you like to see them do? Because that's kind of been the hot take everyone's giving right now. Like, you know, maybe Charles Xavier's been erasing humanity's minds so that they don't know there's mutants. And I don't know, that's, that's again, like kind of a morally ambiguous thing that you don't really, you don't want to see your hero do, but I don't, I don't know what they're going to do. So I was just curious if you had any thoughts on that. Well, here's the thing. The X-Men are like stealth you know no one nobody nobody really knows about the x-men you know what if there's just like a school in upstate new york called yeah. the charles xavier school for gifted youngsters and it's just like a place and we haven't talked about it before because why would we it's just a place mm -hmm. uh, just a general school and maybe secretly uh, there's like some people with superpowers who go out and they 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 do these things and uh you know they're the x-men um I don't know how they're going to handle mutinism and, and how, like, it's been handled. and Because, like, I, I also kind of understand where it come, that it's coming from, where people are like, you can't just say there's always been mutants because, like, that would have come up. And we also had a, a TV show with the Inhumans, and we didn't even mention that in the movies. And it's just like, a, you know what I mean? It's kind of like this, this weird thing that we've never addressed before, but that might be the bull they have to bite. Uh, or maybe it's a new thing. Like maybe mutants just start popping up out of nowhere. Uh, I I don't know. Maybe in the five years mut uh, that got taken away from everybody, uh, mutation started to occur because the population got cut in half. Evolution needed to jump forward. Yeah. Uh, uh, and that's I, I something was, pulled uh, out of my butt right now. Uh, so, like I came up with that as I was saying it. Mm -hmm. So there's probably holes in it, but uh, my thought was. Uh that when they do the the unsnap and and i guess spoilers for endgame but they when they do the un when they bring everyone back in endgame you know you've got the stones and at least one of them well two of the stones give powers like there's one that gave powers to uh to scarlet witch and quicksilver in age of ultron and then there's another stone that the tesseract has gamma or is it the tesseract that gave them powers uh Gave who powers? Uh, Scarlet Witch and... Oh, that was the Mind Stone. Okay, so you got the Tesseract, which they said has, like, it gives off gamma radiation, and then the Mind Stone gives them, give those two powers. So you could say that when he unsnapped and the population came back, that that started, that unleashed, like, untapped powers in a small percentage of people, maybe. Um, that was, I think that's been the best version of it I've, I've seen, because a lot of people, you know... I can't tell you how many times I've seen people say, like, Charles Xavier has been mind-wiping the entire populace, and I'm, I'm just like, I, I don't know about that. But um, they've got, you know, they'll, they'll think of something. Hopefully it'll, I mean, it can't be, it can't possibly be worse than what we've been getting here, right? Like, you know, no. they, the, the, worst ex, the worst MCU movie I think we've had was Thor The Dark World, and even that, I think, at this point, I'd rather watch that than Dark Phoenix. So, like, I think they're going to come up with something better. 
Um, the question I'm I'm curious about is how long are they going to wait? Like, you know, when uh, the Dark, like when Batman Begins came out, that was like what uh, eight years after Batman and Robin. So like, it they have to wait a little bit of time to kind of let people wash their their minds out so that they can like, oh hey, another X Men movie. It's been a while since we've seen one of those. That'll be that'll be nice to see that again. Yeah. So here's an idea. What if like at the beginning of the X Men movie we realize like what we do is like a similar thing with Spider Man Homecoming where uh, it'll be like, it'll probably be in like five or six years before we get this movie, right? Mm -hmm. And what's going to happen is it'll open with Professor Xavier. He goes on over to like uh, old man Captain America who is like selling his, his like the rubble remains of the Avengers facility. (laughs) And then it's like, what are you going to, do? what are you going to, do? like, and then Joe Biden, Captain America is like, hey, what are you going to do with uh, with all this blown up land? And then he's like, well, I'm going to fix it up and make a school because it, in the last five years, I've been, I'm a teacher and uh, blah, blah, blah. I got to make a school and then it'll jump ahead five years and now he runs a school and I'd like to see the first five X-Men. So, yeah. Um, and, you know, I, at this point, like, like I said, it, it cannot be worse than what, we, what we've gotten. So um, that's that's all that I have about Dark Phoenix. Um, I, I don't think we have anything else. We this was this was a movie. Like I said, you know, um, and much as it pains me to say it, I'll probably get it on DVD someday because uh, I've already got all the other X Men movies on DVD. So I might as well complete the set um, because I like to suffer. Yeah, I, I know I'm I'm gonna get it myself when I hit Blu-ray. Um, the best thing about this movie, though, is the it had a cool poster. Uh, yeah. That one that looks like it's painted. That that was a cool poster. Mm-hmm. That one. Yeah. Um, so uh, that's all for right now. What, Connor? What is the next? Um, like, I guess the Joker's coming out. I really don't know if I want to watch that movie. Like, I everyone else has been saying it looks great. I, I think it kind of looks not good. Um, I, what do you think on that one? I mean, I'm gonna see it. Uh, uh-huh. if, if you want to watch it uh, and, and review it, I'm I'm totally down. But hey, if you don't, that's also completely understandable. I know we were kicking around the idea of maybe talking about Scott Pilgrim versus the World sometime this summer, maybe yeah. in the or something. Yeah, that'll be good. We might could do that, like in a. Oops. Sorry, my my mic uh, my mic just fell off my shirt. Um, yeah, we could probably do that in like a few weeks or so. Um, whenever you're feeling it, because uh. I did. Uh, I've watched that uh, since we we tossed that idea around, and I I'd love to talk about that. That's uh, definitely be more enjoyable than this, I think. Um, Sweet, awesome. Yeah. So um, in the meantime, uh, I am the Comics Kid twenty ninety nine. I'm Connor Nielsen. And we will see you guys uh, in a few weeks, probably when we talk about Scott Pilgrim. Uh, in the meantime, have a good one. Oh, Danny boy, Danny boy, Danny boy.